Hello, welcome to this webinar. I do believe we've just opened the waiting room, and in which case there's lots of people flooded in. Oh, I see Dave Farley appear on my screen straight away. Um, okay, so usually we wait a few seconds as the room is filling up because people are always in between meetings, trying to get off the last hangout or the last Zoom call to get into this one. So when that number hits 200, this is when we're gonna start things properly. In the meantime, because we do not like any um, silence, I will just keep talking. To those people who are new to these what the fuck it arts, let me give a brief introduction. Back uh, when the pandemic kicked off and we were all in a bit of a funk about COVID, none of us could go to physical events and all of us were kind of sick of these shitty dry webinars that we were being exposed to. The team at Container Solutions got together and thought, what if we could do something a bit more lively? We prototyped the first uh, WTF session about two weeks ago, and we've got sections about gossip, and we've got industry announcements, as well as really engaging content. So this worked really well. Uh, I must say, we swear a lot at Container Solutions, but even we're sick of hearing the F word now. There's been so much effing and blinding because, because of WTF, it's unbelievable. Um, but nevertheless, you can expect today some awesome content, lots of interesting announcements and lots of special guests. Before we go any further, WTF is meant to be fun. It's not meant to be obnoxious. So we do have a code of conduct. This is an inclusive group. It's a safe group. Somewhere you can express yourself regardless of your sexuality, ethnicity or political views. I said that. I was about to say something political. I will not say that. So we do have a code of conduct. If you would like to know more about my political views, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, Carla, my wonderful colleague. Carla, would you like to say hello? Of course. Hello, Carla. So, hello and welcome, everybody. We are very excited for this What the Fucking Art today. Exactly. Carla will now post the full code of conduct into the Zoom chat so you can study it further. Uh, TLDR. Be nice to each other. Um, right, so today we're going to be speaking about platform as a product with our very special guest, Matthew Skelton. Matthew, would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Very good to have you. Good to see well, you. Hmm. Very good to have you. No, so, Matthew, let me, let me give the audience a little bit of a, a genesis as to this specific webinar. Um, so over the summer, on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, and things like this, it was brought to our attention that people out there in the real world who are adopting cloud native and cloud native technologies, they use both cloud native transformation patterns, which is a book I wrote, and team topologies, which is a book that Matthew wrote. Now, we're not at all jealous of the fact that he sold something like 20 times as many as we have and has 100 times more positive reviews on Amazon. We, we can live with that. But we were very happy to hear both Matthew and myself that the techniques, the guidelines, and the patterns in these books are actually used out there in the wild. Uh, with that in mind, we said, hey, should we do a talk together? And that's what we're doing today. And quite amazingly, we've got nearly 500 signups and 191 people in the webinar right now. Um, this is obviously almost a sign that this content together is very, um, uh, you know, in vogue or useful, or something that people are interested in. Now, before I get into the rest of the webinar, we do have a very special guest, and that special guest is Dave Farley, the author of Continuous Delivery, a book and a technique that has probably, it's fair to say, has changed all of our lives. Dave, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay, welcome to this. So Matthew was telling me earlier that you have uh, uh, different views about platforms or views that might be different to what we think. Is this correct? It's quite quite possibly. I, th I think that... I think that uh, platforms as an idea um, are more often screwed up than being helpful. Uh, Fair enough. So the so, ways, I think that they're a good idea, but they're hard to get right. Right, so we've invited Dave today. Well, first of all, because he's our friend and we love him, but Dave will join the QA at the end of these sessions because obviously he has got a very good opinion. He's very well known. However, we invite everybody to join into the, uh, into the Q and A Everybody on the session has got something valuable to say. Usually people are a bit shy grabbing the mic. I'm happy if you do that. Alternatively, send Carla a message and she will bring you into the discussion when we do the Q&A. Now, the very final guest I'd like to announce just for now is Stuart from Skyscanner. Stuart, are you on the line and do you have your clothes on? I do. 
I do. There we go. But I, I went tartan because we're, you know, Edinburgh based. So yeah. Why well, good. That, that shirt looks like Matthew's shirt. Have you seen Matthew's pictures on social media? He's only got one shirt. Oh, and it looks <laughs> a bit like that one, actually. Okay, Could so we welcome, share it. So welcome, Stuart. Stuart is, of course, the person responsible for uh, building up Skyscanner, a very famous company that has, you know, successfully used cloud native and platforms. He will also be joining alongside Dave as part of our Q&A later. So now let's begin to get into the rest of the webinar. Uh, this is what we're going to be doing. There's a few announcements, just bear with me, calls to actions, follow-ups, things that are coming up in the community. And then your favorite section, industry gossip. At this section, we'll be joined by Adrian Moat and Bill Mulligan. They'll be giving us a few updates, as well as our friend Andy Randall from Kinvoke. And then we'll get into cloud native transformation patterns, which is my part of the webinar, followed by uh, what the fuck is platform as a product, which is Matthews. So here are the announcements. If you're interested in signing up for Matthew's newsletter, Carl is going to drop that link into the chat box right now. You can find more about the book. The book is actually beautiful. It's a beautifully set book and obviously it's become very popular, very powerful within our community. Container Solutions is hiring. You'll be glad to know that we've survived COVID and we've actually started to grow again. It's a lovely company. We are employee owned. Everybody gets shares and options. It's a kind, compassionate, funny place to work. Uh, if you want to join or if you've got a friend who would like to apply for a job, please go ahead and do so. Engineering management position is one of those we're hiring for, but we've got all kinds of, of cool roles. Again, follow the links in the chat box. If you want to subscribe to WTF, click on that link when you see the deck later or in the chat box. I've said that about 20 times now. This will get you access to the newsletter. It will get you access to the webinars in advance. If you don't want to subscribe and you don't give a shit about all that marketing stuff, then don't bother. Follow us on Twitter where we will announce the same things in real time anyway. You may like to jump, jump over to the blog. Here we have a range of our engineers, including Adrian Moat, and they are trying to answer the question, what the fuck is cloud native? By the way, nobody actually knows. This is what this whole program of work is about. And a 20 second elevator pitch, somebody count me down. <gasps> Container Solutions are very good at helping people to succeed with platforms and we provide a 24 seven CRE service. If you're going to cloud native and you need firepower strategy help, then get in touch with us. We are not gonna do any more selling in this webinar. I only bring this up because I know there's a lot of people in the webinar who are already speaking to our sales team. So that's just the pitch. This is what we do. If you're interested, drop us a message. If not, just enjoy the rest of the show. And that brings me to my favourite section. Bill, come and tell us what has been going on at KubeCon. Yeah, absolutely. It's an ex super exciting this week uh, at KubeCon Virtual uh, North America. There's two exciting initiatives that I want to talk about that the CNCF is kind of launching and that Priyanka uh, noted in her, in her keynote uh, yesterday. The first one is the CNF working group uh, kickoff. And that's around if you're interested in cloud native and telcos and how those two intersect or don't intersect, depending on your opinion, uh, please join that, that group. Uh, the kickoff meeting is happening later today. There's a lot more information there. The second so one. Is, so this is the last bastion for cloud native telecommunications. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. When you're going all the way back down to the copper wire, you know, there's a little bit of uh, momentum that you need to have before you finally catch on to some, some new age technologies. <laughs> so those people who are interested in that working group, there's going to be a link down in the chat box. And of course, the second one, very timely, isn't it, Bill? The Inclusive Naming Initiative. Yeah. So uh, as Jamie said, uh, we're trying to create uh, inclusive communities. Uh, you have a code of conduct here. Uh, we do at the CNCF too. And we're trying to create... Uh, make cloud native computing ubiquitous. And the only way to do that is to really make everybody feel comfortable. So this inclusive naming initiative is launching right now to help people have the frameworks, the blueprints to update uh, their code base to eliminate uh, like charge terminology and replace it with neutral things that are more uh, understandable to people um, everywhere so that we can really create an inclusive and welcoming cloud native community. Exactly. I guess some of our naming conventions were pretty old fashioned. And, you know, when, when, when we started out, maybe me and Dave especially, things are different than they are now. And so even some of the naming conventions within our programs needs to change to reflect the changing times, I guess. 
Yeah, and so that one's also kicking off today uh, at KubeCon, and the, I think the link's gonna be posted in the chat. If you did a spoiler alert, have you just destroyed the keynote? Uh, no, it was yesterday. So luckily, I won't get in too much too much trouble with Priyanka. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Okay, thank you so much, but like, we're really appreciative of you keeping up to up to date with all the CNCF activities and coming in and sharing with us. Now, let me bring in at that moment my colleague and friend, well, friend, who's more like my friend. Anyway. Is he okay? Uh, Adrian Moatz. Adrian, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm not too bad. Um, I should warn you, my dog is trying to tell me that it's time to go for a walk. So if you hear him bark in the background, I apologize. So tell us, Adrian, what's been going on in the hallways at KubeCon? Yeah, so I'm not going to say him at the official platform, but there has I've been really impressed with the stuff that's kind of going on around KubeCon. So there's a, a, a live Twitch stream that um, not, that they do like pre and post show. So I totally go and check that out. That was quite cool. Um, there's a Slack channel and people are really hanging out there. And there has been some Zoom calls, I think, for people to have sort of breakouts. But the thing that I really thought was pretty cool was somebody launched like this thing called Rambly. And I'm pretty sure it's just an attendee, and but it kind of took over the hallway track. And if you go on to Rambly, it's a little bit like Animal Crossing. So you can sort of wonder about as a sort of top down 2D character or three quarters view, I guess. Um, yeah. And you can talk to different groups. So it's actually come the closest I've seen to sort of recreating a sort of hallway feeling at a conference. So yeah, I totally go and check that out and we'll drop a link in later. And actually I think Teresa and Carla are here. So I think we should look at using something like that in our own conferences. Very cool. I was not, I actually, when you said rambly, I thought you were going to do a Scottish ramble. You were going to ramble about what you'd picked up in the hallways. No, I don't know why it's called rambly. I guess you can ramble about and talk to different yeah, people. Yeah, very cool. Um, and the other thing was funding announcement. So at KubeCon, everybody likes to announce uh, new products and new rounds of funding. Um, two that I wanted to talk about, um, Garden, um, which I think they do like um, Kubernetes, or help you sort of integrate Kubernetes clusters into development workflow. Um, so they've got quite an interesting product and they announced like uh, 3.1 million funding. Um, Isovalent, if I, I guess this is a weaker so ago, um, they they announced 29 million funding and they do like the Cilium um, network and security product that's based on um, eBPF. So that's a really interesting product. And I think that'll actually do really well in the future. Um, a couple of other ones, Sigup, who I think an Italian company, right? I think we've talked to them before. Um, and they have a Kubernetes distribution. Uh, and they got 40 million of funding. Uh, and then there's Gravitational, who do a, a Teleport, I think is their main product. Um, and sort of secure access wow. to clusters and things. Some big checks being written. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'm oh. sure there's lots more that I don't even know about. But yeah, Garden and Nice Avail, I thought were really cool. Brilliant. Okay, so thank you, Adrian, for that. That's much appreciated. Uh, I'm sure people can follow the rest of the news from this from uh, KubeCon on Twitter. That'll be hashtag, hashtag KubeCon. And then our final announcement is from uh, the guys at Kinfolk. Andy and Joachim, are you on the line? Yes, Jamie, uh, thanks for that. It's been an exciting week for us at KubeCon as, as well. Um, we had a couple of announcements. We announced some uh, new distro versions for uh, Flatcar Container Linux, but the thing that's got the most attention, I think, is the new project uh, Headlamp that we announced. Um, and that's a modern, extensible UI for Kubernetes. Um, but I actually uh, should not be the one to talk about it because Joachim, my colleague who's on the call, is the brains behind it. And uh, maybe, Joachim, if you're, if you're on, you can tell us why the fuck did we think it was time to build a new UI for Kubernetes in the spirit of this uh, what the fuck in there? Hey, everybody. <clears throat> yeah. So the, like you said, there, there are lots of uh, UIs out there, uh, but uh, none that uh, actually filled the, the needs we, we had uh, at the time. So, you know, they, they had to be open source, actively maintained. Uh, one thing we wanted also was that it had to be deployed as a, <coughs> sorry, a desktop app or in cluster and um, allow the user to change things. So not just like a dashboard where you cannot, uh, where you can just look at things, not, not change them. Uh, and very importantly, it had to be extensible. So, you know, uh, Headlamp allows plugins. Uh, our first plugin is actually for a service we have um, or a tool we have called Inspector Gadget that just gives you the, the system, the syscalls uh, for a pod, even when the pod is, is dead. Uh, that's something that not every, uh, every Kubernetes cluster out there, uh, <coughs> sorry, 
has installed. So uh, you know, so so it's a, it's a good use case for a plugin. And uh, if you want a quick summary of uh, Headlamp and many other UIs, uh, I will be giving a talk today at KubeCon with uh, Henning Jacobs from, from Zalando very good. at 8.55. No, you, uh, snuck in, you snuck in that plug for your talk very conveniently. We didn't agree with that in advance, but you know, that's okay. Very well done. Yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, I will say two things. Carla will post, post in the blog, uh, into the chat box, and later if you get her the link for your talk, then we'll make sure we share that with the group today. Thank you for all my guests there on the gossip and the announcement. You've done that in record time, which means that we're not hanging about for too long. Much appreciated. Um, and yeah, if anybody's got any questions uh, for uh, regarding that stuff, please let us know. Okay, and now we can think about getting into the content of today. The thing we wanted to talk about, which is namely cloud native transformation patterns, at least this is what I'm gonna be speaking about and how they relate to platforms. And the idea behind this talk is to give a general understanding uh, of cloud native transformation and how that works in relationship to platforms. And I'm trying to set up Matthew, who is the real speaker today, the real sort of guest. Uh, and so in a way you can see what I'm about to do as something like a warm up act. Um, so what am I gonna do? This is a good question. I'm gonna talk about the following three things. Don't ask me why that middle text is red, I don't know. Um, I'm gonna be talking about wealth grid and classic mistakes. Wealth grid is, an, is a fictional um, company that appears in our book but it's, a, it's an amalgamation of all the companies that we've worked with and all that we've studied in the last six years of doing this. We're then gonna talk about a pattern language for cloud native. We're gonna find out how this helps you to design your transformation. And then finally, we're gonna look at how we do that to indeed design uh, transformations and movements towards cloud native. So all great literature is one of two stories. A man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. Now we're about to find out which one Wealthgrid is on. Um, so who are Wealthgrid? Wealthgrid are the fictional uh, company that appear in our book, Cloud Native Transformation. Wealthgrid could very easily sit in the, you know, the 500 square meters around my office here in London because it's a mid-sized financial company. You may be able to relate to some of the characters. Uh, Jenny, our hero, is a technical manager. She works for Steve, the CEO, and is responsible for the career needs, the emotional needs, and the information needs of a group of engineers. Now, Steve desperately wants to stay off the front page of the newspaper. He does not want to appear in the BBC, uh, on the BBC website, nor does he want to appear in The Guardian or The Telegraph because their product has had an outage. This is bad enough for any uh, consumer facing product, but it's even worse when you work in finance because of the devastating effect it has on your reputation. I recently asked people. Oh, hello. I don't know if that was a question uh, or if somebody forgot to mute themselves. I'm just going to assume you forgot to mute yourselves. The last time we did this, somebody took a sales call in the webinar and we couldn't, we couldn't mute him. A, a technical manager, uh, uh, Steve cares about uh, time to value as well. He understands the importance of turning features around quickly and he's starting to get a feel for digital technologies and how they can help his business. The engineers also care about time to value, but they're very interested in all of these cool tools and technologies. The team from WealthQuid would almost certainly be at KubeCon today and yesterday. But there is a stranger coming. The stranger is the competitive threat to Wealthgrid and companies like her. What do these strangers look like? Well, you've got the people within your industry who are learning to use cloud native and platforms to not only consolidate their market position, but to potentially extend it. ING Bank in the Netherlands went very early. They would have been talking about DevOps 10 years ago and Agile. Nowadays, they're talking about cloud native. They went very early with this technology, very early with cloud native processes, and in doing so, not only consolidated their hold on retail banking in the Netherlands, but they were also able to extend it. Some would argue that they have won the war for users, and in the Netherlands, they have won the war for talent. Quite unbelievably, ING has started to appear on the British high street. So they are now starting to come to play in, a in an area or in a in a backyard where they've never played before. 
This I find particularly interesting. Uh, so it's not completely fictional that these cloud native companies pose a threat to existing companies. I don't suppose anybody in the UK thought ING would come here. The other threat to WealthGrid is really around the digital upstarts. So about two weeks ago, Anne Bowden, the CEO and founder of Starling, uh, released a book and it tells the story of Starling Bank. They started building stuff in January 2016. They had a fully functioning bank by January 2017. They were able to do this because they had a clean slate and they very, very effect effectively used cloud native to build their infrastructure and to capture their user needs and user requirements. This is a serious threat to anybody who's currently entrenched in a market leading position. Nobody's gonna catch Starling, in my opinion, in the UK. There's no way any of the existing banks are gonna catch up with Starling's digital offering. Happy to be wrong, but I don't think I am. And then of course, the other thing that's keeping Jenny awake at night is the big tech giants. Most people can understand or they see the competitive threats from within their own industry. The, the competitive threats we don't see coming are the ones that come from with, outside our industry. This is something that we've all awoken to in the last 10 years. Amazon have got a banking license. Nobody knows what they're going to do with it. But what would happen if Amazon decided to come and play in the same garden where WealthGrid play? play? So Jenny starts to have this wake up call. We have to do something. Well, what is that something? Well, of course, it's cloud native, isn't it? She understands about the cloud, Amazon, Google, has a feel for microservices, kind of understands what Kubernetes is. She sees that lots of people are doing this and they're succeeding with it. So the very first attempt at going cloud native, as it were, from Jenny, is to start to use the cloud native tool. So we're going to chuck things in containers and we're going to chuck them on a Kubernetes because we're going to chuck that up in the public cloud. It doesn't work. Now the slide says six to 12 months. In reality, this can be 18 months or even two years. So something's happened here. The cloud native work has gone pretty slowly. Hardly anything's been delivered, just the basics. They definitely don't have anything like a minimum viable product, and they're definitely not continuously delivering uh, to uh, uh, the, the public cloud. So all of a sudden, Jenny's second wake up call comes. The second wake-up call is basically around this. This thing's a lot harder than we thought. So she now has to speak to Steve. They make a plan. Steve's a bit pissed off. He's a bit miffed. But, you know, it's a safe environment. WealthGrid's a nice company. So Jenny's not in serious trouble. They make a plan to which the plan gets approval from Steve and the other executives. This is basically what they do. They say, let's create a new platform team a cloud native team. They're going to make sure that uh, our cloud infrastructure is set up. Uh, they're going to make sure that they know how to onboard the rest uh, of the company's applications. And we'll let the rest of the engineering team just work on our applications and products and turn around new features. The mistake that they make is as follows. They have the false assumption that the platform team or the investment into the platform will be instantly returned. So they know that they've split their engineering capability in two, but they assume that the return on the investment into cloud will come back immediately. And therefore the uh, uh, application development teams will be able to keep turning features around as quickly as they did before. This is a mistake. Um, six to 12 months later, more likely 18 months later, hardly any of the platforms complete. They might have a minimal viable product, but they have nothing that's ready for production. And actually, the backlog of applications and new features and, and new uh, user requests has actually hardly moved at all. This cloud native thing took a lot more work and a lot more brain power than they had envisaged. Why is this so fucking difficult? This is a question WealthGrid asked themselves. It's a question all of our customers have asked themselves as well. This is more or less why. Um, most people think of cloud native as a technical thing. So a company might have a, a client server architecture. They might use APIs. Those APIs might be exposed properly and they can connect lots of client apps to them. 
you know, so the logic goes something like this. Well, if we're client server, we're really only one step away from microservices. And if we're only one step away from microservices architecturally, then we're only two steps away from chucking them in containers and chucking them upon the cloud. In other words, WellSquid assumed cloud native was a technical problem. Stuff in containers, containers on the cloud, right? This is a mistake. Cloud native is at least partially all, I can't count them, nine, all nine of these dimensions. Let's go back to Starling Bank again. So the thing about cloud native culture is, it, is that it's collaborative. So Greg Hawkins, the CTO of Starling, or the former CTO, he tells this great story. Um, in finance, you need to have more rigor with how you deploy. So you can't do continuous deployment of financial stuff like you would, uh, for example, a non-mission critical application. You need executive sign-off for everything that you deploy. So to make sure this was collaborative, they set up an automation and they set up a Slack channel and the executives at Starling Bank could approve deployments. So, so, so the story goes, and the CEO would approve deployment while she was in a board meeting on her telephone from within Slack. Hugely collaborative. This collaboration might be supported by tools like Git and Jira and Slack, but of course it requires a certain mindset. So of course that's got nothing to do with technology, has it? And then as Matthew will teach us, the way we do teams in cloud native is radically different. So in the book, uh, we talk about, Matthew talks about stream aligned teams and platform teams and complicated subset teams. You cannot succeed with large scale distributed system engineering or distributed programming unless you alter the way you team up. So the mistake was to assume this was all technical when in fact there's a lot of other different dimensions. So now the third and final wake up call comes. What does Jenny do now? Well, if she goes to conferences and if she starts reading books, she will find out what we, or more, more or less most of us know already, cloud native is so much more than technology. So I did say WellScreen was an amalgamation of our customers. So in Jenny's case, what did she do? Well, she discovered uh, cloud native transformation patterns. And transformation patterns help you design your transformation. And of course, famously, I've got, I've got two of the pattern cards right in front of me. Famously, continuous delivery is a success pattern of large scale cloud native, and so too is the platform team. So now let's just take a step back from the wealth grid story and see if we can get our heads around what patterns actually are and how they can help you to succeed when it comes to building platforms and moving towards cloud native. Simply put, pattern languages are a collection of design decisions. So you can think of a pattern as a word in a dictionary, table, chair, sofa. And patterns have got this quite unique property. You see those things on the left, they're very instantly recognizable as tables. They're also instantly recognizable as being very different. This is something that's quite cool about patterns. The house I live in in Greenwich is very different to the house I was raised in Hull, and yet they are both instantly recognizable as houses. Now, you can combine these words or these patterns into a language. And once you've got your language, um, you can then start doing design. So in patterns and pattern languages, designs are simply stories. There is a square table with four chairs and a sofa in a room. So the question is, what is a cloud native transformation pattern language? Well, it's this. A, pattern, a cloud native transformation pattern language is a collection of design decisions about cloud native practices and technologies, and importantly, the context in which they work. So one of the mistakes people make when they go to a conference is they see an idea that works at Netflix, the Chaos Monkey, for example, and they think that sounds cool and they bring it back to their offices or their workplaces, but it does not work in that context. So if we uh, take a look in the book, I've got, I'm gonna use props, I don't know if that's actually working. Patterns have always followed the same pattern. There's this introduction and the very next section is the context in which they work. 
So the point is, is that patterns are context specific. And by providing the context within the pattern, it helps people like Jenny and Steve best understand how they will work for them. So let's do a quick recap as to what happened so far with Jenny and then find out how she used patterns to begin to succeed. The first attempt was as such. They basically didn't bring in too much creativity. They tried to tack on all of this cloud native stuff into business as usual. If they were doing Scrum, they chucked these tasks onto the Scrum backlog. If they were doing Kanban, they threw them up onto the wall. The next attempt was a little bit more interesting, but it was a classic mistake. And if you're on this call and you're about to make this mistake, then maybe you should be quickly taking some notes. This is a very expensive mistake, mistake number two, because it sets you back so far. The second mistake was to take, you know, the most creative engineers, chuck them into this platform team, and then assume that there would be an instant return on that investment. This doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. The third attempt from Jenny was to take what she learned from our book and then from Matthew's book and all the cool stuff we learned about at conferences and start to explicitly design this, this transformation. Which patterns did she use? What did she start with? Well, the first ones in Wealthgrid's case were around uh, the business case, the transformation um, uh, champion and executive commitment. And executive commitment seems to be a super pattern. We have not seen a single, a single uh, foundative transformation that did not have a committed executive team. In our book, we've got some really cool case studies. Starling Banker in there, uh, Adidas are in there, they were very generous to provide a case study. And right at the very beginning of the Starling case study uh, is indeed executive commitment. We simply haven't seen cloud native work where there isn't executive commitment. And then from there, we start to develop the vision, uh, the core team, the transformation strategy. This is where things get uh, interesting. In the case of Wealthgrid, they separate out the creative work that's required to build a platform from scratch and the proficient work that's required to keep the lights going and keep the features of the products coming out. What's not obvious on this slide is of course, Wealthgrid had to hire people to do this because this is not, this is not doable given your current uh, uh, team and your current staff because it's a whole different set of skills. Down on the platform side of things, we're doing things like uh, proofs of concepts, minimum viable products, minimum viable platforms, and we're doing exploratory experiments. As the work begins to shuffle along, we then get to a point in time where we can begin to onboard our application from the rest of the organization. It's very important to know this pattern. It says, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, next, next slide. <laughs> it's very important to know this last pattern, gradual onboarding. This is a transformation pattern. And it's very simple. When you've built a new platform, and you start to onboard applications to it, things will go wrong. So for goodness sakes, you have to go slowly. Two things will happen. You'll shake out any problems in the platform and you'll shake out any problems in the applications that you're trying to onboard. Was it containerized properly? Have we done monitoring properly? Et cetera, et cetera. Again, going back to the book, Adidas, the Adidas case to be is extremely explicit that one of their success factors was the gradual nature in which they onboarded applications and the gradual nature in which they developed their platform. Mm -hmm. And finally, in the case of Wealthgrid, not always the case, they were able to strangle their monoliths. Whatever remaining uh, real estate or landscape, technical landscape was left, they were able to strangle it, break it down into microservices and thus get cost-effective uh, uh, cloud computation usage every single month. So we can now start to wrap this whole thing up. Mistake number one, business as usual. Mistake number two, assume that this cloud stuff will work instantly. We finally get it right when we balance both creativity and proficiency. This is when Wellspread have gone, gone cloud native. What have they really got? They've got a system of innovation at that point. That's the magic trick of cloud native. It's not, it's not stuff on containers in the cloud. It's not even build automation, which is rather cool. 
Rather, it's a way to consistently adapt to changing using needs, changing user needs and changing requirements and to have this awesome platform for digital innovation. And indeed, platform is the right word because in our experience and in the case of WealthGrid, they built a cloud native platform which everything else was based upon. That is, in my opinion, how the cloud native transformation dovetails into the work around platforms and treating platforms as a product. Finish. And at that point, I'm going to now slowly bring Matthew in. You don't need to share your screen yet, Matthew. Um, and while I'm doing that, I would also like to ask, does anybody have any questions about that point as I come out of sharing my screen and Matthew starts to begin to think about sharing his? Any questions for me there, Carla? Yeah, I kind of have a question. Go for it. Yeah, hello, David. Welcome to the What the Fucking Are. Hello. Hello, hello. I, I didn't get the, the, the sentence with uh, what the fucking what? I said welcome. Welcome to the What the Fucking Are. Oh, okay. Ah, because the, it's not a webinar. Oh, right. Correct. Very good, yeah. <laughs> Genius. Thank you. It was not mine, but I'll steal it. That's what chief executives do. What's your question, David? Uh, you're an executive, actually? Allegedly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for me, the interesting part is uh, you, you talked about executive commitment, and I imagine if you're an executive who can actually talk details, you in the environments that you find yourself in, you didn't uh, generally have the problem. But in trying to look for uh, case studies uh, or in getting to where you are right now, I imagine you had to fight quite a bunch with Conway's law, right? And uh, the problem that existing organizational structures um, kind of demand your focus elsewhere and um, uh, necessitate many people in your environment to optimize locally for something that inhibits change. The, so I think right now I'm facing similar problems and I would like some advice regarding that. Well, so I mentioned earlier that one of the common patterns for cloud native transformation is around existential threat. So literally on the street outside, if you step out this thing and turn 90 degrees, the Financial Times is about 200 meters over the River Thames. If I stick my head out the window, I can see their sign. Now, the FT started to become cloud native because there was an existential threat to their business model. There was simply no way that they could compete in the world of uh, online media uh, unless they had a great digi digital offering. You will only fight Conway's law and you will only win against it if there is, if the, the, if there is the desire to do it. Uh, and for most companies, there's no desire there. So I'm afraid it's terrible. I don't know if I have advice for you, but if you're, in a, if you're in a setup where there is no existential pressure, no business need to adopt cloud native, you will not adopt it. You will fanny around with it. You'll flap around like a fish in the water for a few years. You'll burn a few million pounds, but not much will change. And so you need that executive commitment. And the best way to get that is to have either an existential threat or such a compelling chance to capture value that the executives can no longer deny it. Can I, can I jump in and add, add to that? Definitely, Dave, yeah. Uh, so so I, I, think, I think one of the things that organizations often get wrong is, uh, is seeing organizational strategy as a thing that's kind of set in concrete. Mm -hmm. It's a tool. We, we, the, the, the way in which we structure our organizations is done in order to achieve some kind of business end. Mm -hmm. And so if we, if we view it in, the, in that light, then I think this is broader than just cloud native. This is about digital disruption. If you want to, if you want to do more innovative things, then you organize to facilitate that. And the way that you do that is by going for fast feedback, experimental development, trying out ideas, exploring. And that's a very different kind of organizational structure. And if you look at nearly all of the organizations that we think of as exemplars and, and you know, excellent at this kind of stuff, they don't look like traditional organizations. So I think the mistake is to see organizational structure as a rigid thing rather than as a tool to achieve an end. Absolutely. Okay, so I, that's really appreciative of the question, David, and then the, the answer, Dave. I can see Matthew's got his slides up now. 
There are some other questions. I won't forget them. Uh, we'll come back to them later. But for now, I'd like to hand over to Matthew and, of course, give him a, a small round of applause and welcome to uh, this uh, What the Fucking Are. Matthew, over to you. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everyone. It's good to be here. Um, it's, I'm really happy to be doing this today because it's such a good combination of uh, cloud native transformation patterns and uh, team topology. They, they, they're, they're like best friends, effectively. So just a quick intro to me. I'm the co-author of this book here, Team Topologies. The subtitle is Organizing Business and Technology Teams for Fast Flow. So just like uh, Dave Farley just said, it's, it's actually contextual. The, the patterns in the Team Topologies book are optimized for a fast flow of change, fast flow of software changes towards a live environment. If you're working in an organization that wants a nice slow flow of change or not even any flow at all, that's fine. You'll find some different patterns, just as Dave, just as Dave kind of implied. But most organizations these days, you know, we're looking for a rapid flow of change because that's how we make sure we don't get eaten by the competition. Um, the book was published in uh, September 2019, just over a year ago, by IT Revolution Press. That's the home of books like DevOps Handbook, Phoenix Project, Accelerate, and so on. A whole really a really great family of books. Basically, any book from IT Revolution Press is, is a really good really good to have uh, and, and read. The Team Topologies book has been described as innovative tools and concepts for structuring the next generation digital operating model. This is kind of strategic level stuff. Um, so, you know, it's, it's at least CTO, CIO, but actually really CEO should be thinking about these kind of things because it's, it's, it's of strategic importance to your organization. If your organization uses any amount of software to help it make the business happen. So... What is platform as a product and why should I adopt this approach? That's what I'll try to answer in, in, the, in this little, uh, uh, little talk now. And there's basically four sections. We'll look at what is a platform to start with. We'll look at what really is a product. It's worth, it's worth revisiting that. We've got a few examples of organizations using platform as a product and then a few ideas at the very end about getting started. So let's just have a little look at what, what we think a platform should be. In the Team Topologies book, we actually use this definition here from Evan Botcher from ThoughtWorks as our kind of as a kernel. It's, it's such, a, such a, uh, a, um, a rich description. And Evan Botcher says, a digital platform is a foundation of self-service APIs, tools, services, knowledge, and support, which are arranged as a compelling internal product. Now, there's a whole load of stuff in there, so let's just dissect it a bit. The first thing, the starting point, is self-service tools and services. Self-service APIs, tools, and services. It's the self-service bit which is really key. We, there are no emails to the platform team saying, hey, please can you spin up a new Kubernetes cluster? There's no JIRA tickets that get created saying, hey, please can you reconfigure this network uh, connection? None of that. It's self-service for development teams that are using this platform. It's absolutely crucial. There'll be some tools as well, some little command line tools or some little kind of uh, schema validation tools, whatever it is, um, to, to, to help uh, development team, engineering teams, data teams build and test and validate things uh, alongside that. But there's also knowledge and support. The knowledge base, like frequently, frequently asked questions, kind of onboarding guides, very detailed um, documentation and descriptions of how to use the, the platform and the tooling, descriptions of the principles behind the platform so people can kind of align their development approaches to those principles. And then at some point, something will, will not be quite working properly because we're moving very quickly. There's some real human beings there to help support teams trying to use the platform. And it's built as a compelling internal product. This means development teams want to use the platform. It's, it's, it's compelling that in, I look at it as, a, as a coming from a development team and I want to go, yep, that looks really great. Let me have access to this platform, please. I want to use that. It's going to help me deliver. And it's an internal product. We, we, we treat this kind of in the same, with the same principles as if we were building a, a public product. And we'll look at that a little bit later. So these approaches are actually uh, included in the ThoughtWorks technology radar from May 2020. It's not quite the most recent. It's the, it's the one earlier this year. Um, but in there, uh, ThoughtWorks recommend that, that companies uh, adopt this pattern of applying product management to internal platforms. 
So they've been testing that out for, for, for many months and years. And this is a thing which basically is now should be standard. This is something you should be doing. And they also recommend uh, trialing the use of um, uh, engineering, multiple engineering teams inside, inside, um, inside a platform. So basically software engineering teams inside a platform, which is, which is quite different from how many platforms were, were built traditionally. Inside that edition of the volume 22 of the ThoughtWorks Technology Radar, they say, we've been using the concepts from team topologies to split platform teams into our in, in, in our projects into enablement teams, core platform within a platform teams and stream focused teams. So they've actually really been trying out some of these, some of these ideas. There is a, the, the way I see a platform now is this, a platform is a curated experience for engineers, the engineers being the customers of the, of the platform. I wish I'd included this quotation in the Team Topologies book itself. I didn't. I only came up with this kind of conception this year, early this year, but there we go. So think about a platform as a curated experience for engineers. It's not about the technology, although the technology is really important, really, really important. Our starting point is the user experience of people who are using that platform. Drive everything else from there. And that, that's, where, that's where success lies. And crucial, so we have to make sure it's reliable. We have to make sure it's usable and it's fit for purpose. But our customers are voluntary. These engineering teams using our product are voluntary. They have the option of using it, but they're not forced to use the platform. And that's an important dynamic. And we'll come to that a little bit later in the, in the talk today. What we're trying to do is create a path of least resistance. So this is Evan Botcher again from 2018. Uh, he's saying, make the right thing the easiest thing to do. We're trying to make, if there's a good way of applying, uh, you know, uh, applying conf configuration into Kubernetes clusters, or there's a good way of uh, renewing uh, TLS certificates, then make that really easy. Make the right way to do it really easy so that we don't, we're not, so that other development teams are not fighting with all these different concepts. Um, no, no standard. At the moment, there's no low. In the Team Topologies book, we define four different team types, only four different types of team that we think are needed for modern uh, software delivery. And the starting point is a stream aligned team. End to end responsibility for delivery of uh, new software changes from, uh, from version control all the way into production. So sometimes it's called you build it, you run it. There are no handoffs in there at all. The three other types of team are there effectively only to help these stream aligned teams deliver. And specifically, these other three types of team are there to reduce the cognitive load on these streamlined teams. If the streamlined team is fully independent, it would have to build absolutely everything. It would have to build all the cloud infrastructure. Maybe even if, you, if you're really extreme, it would build its own data center. And then all the app software applications on top, and then it's fully independent. But at some point, that's too much for it to do. So we define a kind of layer, which ends up being called a platform, below which they don't need to worry about all this stuff and they just focus on the kind of the business differentiating aspects of, of, the, of the software. Crucially, there's a fast flow of change, but they're also getting feedback from the live systems in the form of telemetry. So logging, metrics, all this kind of stuff, but also user feedback. And so we bring that back into our, into our awareness as a team to help us build that product better. Um, and the platform, platform comes in, as I said, in order to effectively minimize or reduce some of the cognitive load on these streamlined teams that would otherwise be in place. We also define three different team interaction modes. So we think it's, it's worth defining the way in which teams should interact inside the organization. Um, and this relates to things like uh, Conway's law and, and um, being able to sense when boundaries are wrong. Collaboration is two teams working together for a defined period of time to achieve a specific outcome, usually discovery of where an API should sit. And then we've got X as a service where one team is providing and one team consuming something. And there's very little need for communication at that point, because if we've got the boundary right, it's a nice friction free kind of interaction, nicely well defined. And that could that could last for, for a long period of time. Facilitating is one team kind of helping another team to bridge a capability gap or to move from one technology to another, something like that. Uh, collaboration and facilitation are temporary, temporary interaction modes. They might only last for a few weeks. X as a service could potentially last for months or years if, we've, if we found the right boundary. We'll come back to these a little bit later. 
Um, team, team cognitive load is a really important concept in teams' apologies. Cognitive load is, is, is the total amount of mental effort being used in the working memory, defined by John Sweller in 1988. And cognitive load is important in a in software context because when we're building software, whether we're writing code or whether we're working on um, configuration of systems or diagnosis, we're, we're effectively in a learning mode. And so cognitive load comes in when, when, we're, when, we're, when we're in situations when we're learning. And what we're trying to do, there's broadly three different kinds of uh, cognitive load. There's intrinsic, which sort of relates to the skills that we've learned extraneous, which is sort of the mechanism by which we're sort of learning or, or, or doing something, and germane, which is our main domain focus. Um, and um, what we're trying to do is we have to deal with some of the intrinsic cognitive load, which is we have to learn some stuff about the technology. But then we're trying to minimize the extraneous cognitive load, because these are the things that are not really relevant to what we're trying to do. Like, oh, how do I deploy the application again? How do I configure that service? It's not relevant. It's not relevant to my main focus of, I don't know, um, you know banking or bank transfers or something like that. I'm trying to make as much space as possible for germane cognitive load, which allows me to keep the, the kind of domain model in my head or you know, translate that into code or, or whatever it is that we're doing. So here's the key thing. In the past, platforms, uh, things that were called platforms were often often tended to increase the cognitive load on teams that were using them. They were so complicated. There were so many different things to think about. We, these, these old style platforms had not thought about the user experience or the developer experience. Not, they didn't have very good documentation. They tended to increase the cognitive load on teams, which therefore is going to reduce the flow of change towards production. So a really key aspect of a good uh, platform is the platform should not increase the cognitive load on teams using the platform. If anything, it should reduce it. So it's a, a really key aspect to make sure we're thinking about the effect of what we're building on the teams that are using it, particularly from the point of view of, of cognitive load. In the Team to Bodies book, we also talk about the need to make sure we're building a thinnest viable platform. What's the, th what's the smallest platform that we can build? Uh, in the UK, we have these chocolates, which are called after eight, and that's like the thinnest viable chocolate. They're really very, very thin like this. Um, the thinnest viable platform is the smallest set of APIs, documentation, and tools needed to accelerate teams developing modern software services and systems. We're not trying, to, we're not trying to build something massive. We're trying actually to build the smallest amount of stuff needed, um, and we're focusing on how well are we accelerating these teams using the platform to deliver safely and rapidly? And that's because software developers love building platforms. I mean, this, I include myself in this. Without a strong product management input, we're going to build a bigger platform than needed. That's, that's the view of, of Alan Kelly. Um, let me give an example of a thinnest viable platform. Let's say we have a wiki page that lists four services from Amazon, from AWS, or Azure, or Google Cloud, or wherever, list four services, and some example configuration. And it says, if you use these four services in this way, with this example configuration, you'll be able to have a good starting point. This will help you to get started with this approach. That's a platform, a wiki page listing some, some options with some suggested default configuration. That is a platform in itself. We've not had to build any code. What we've done is we've curated the experience for those, those teams that need to use it. We've done the thinking, we've done the investigation, we brought our expertise to bear in defining this, this, this wiki page with a list of, uh, list of options. And if that is the only thing we need to accelerate delivery, then that's all we should do. Obviously, lots of organizations, you'll need to build something bigger, but, but that's our starting point. We're not trying to build something massive. So a good platform is just big enough, but no bigger. And as Jamie said earlier, we're expecting this platform to evolve. It has to change and adapt. We're not just building something that's gonna be static. The technology is changing so quickly that we have to plan for and explicitly anticipate the evolution of what we're providing. And this is where these team interaction modes uh, come in. Uh, as Jamie said earlier, we need to have very strong collaboration 
between the platform and the, the streamlined teams, the, the, the engineering teams that are using this platform to discover how this new service should work. How do we know how uh, this logging service would work or this metric service? How do we know how, how it should work? We've got to work with, the platform group has got to work with streamlined teams, our customers, to understand what their needs are and exactly how this new service needs to work. So we're explicitly expecting a combination of collaboration and providing something as a service. And this is these kind of different ways of interacting are happening all the time, depending on which team we're talking to, which engineering team we're talking to. And generally speaking, it looks like this. We've got a kind of intense period of discovery and eventually we start to work out where that API should sit and then we can provide it as a service. But we are not starting out by just building something and, say, and saying use it. That's a, that's, that's a bad thing to do. What we are doing is working with our customer teams, our customers, the engineering teams using our platform, working with them, collaborating, understanding where the boundary should sit, and then finally providing that as a service. So it's really crucial to clarify these service boundaries and provide abstractions to reduce the cognitive load on teams. Otherwise, the danger is that we get the abstraction in the wrong place and increase cognitive load. Um, there's a, as an example later in this, uh, a little bit later in this talk, of uh, from uh, Uswitch, a UK-based company, who have done this really, really well. So we'll come to that in a little bit later. Before we do that, let's look at what really is a product. This might sound a bit strange, but bear with me because it will be valuable. Let's start off with uh, uh, an authoritative reference from Wikipedia. So a product is anything that can be offered to the market to satisfy the desire or need of a customer. Okay, fine. That's all right. But here we go. We're satisfying needs of a customer. We're meeting user needs. That's a starting point. That should be the starting point for our platform. How do we meet our user needs? It's certainly not the starting point for lots of platforms of the past. Uh, we can also get some clues from uh, Marty Kagan, who is from Silicon Valley Product Group. And he talks about products being a holistic user experience, functionality, design, monetization, and content in there. And again, that again starts with the user and their needs and their experience. It doesn't start with the technology. If I'm walking down the high street, uh, I've not done that recently, very often for obvious reasons. But anyway, I was in the center of Leeds uh, a few months ago. I took this picture here of a shoe shop. Um, no one is going to rush out of the shoe of this sports shop and force me to buy a pair of trainers, sneakers. No one's going to do that. This is optional. Buying a pair of trainers, sh fo uh, shoes like this, sneakers, is, is optional. That's kind of a key aspect of a product. So the product is optional to use. No one is forced to use that product. Another aspect is that we're carefully designing this product. We're using the right tools. We're shaping it in the right way. We're thinking about how it's going to be used. So a product is carefully designed and curated. And also a product simplifies something for users. I took this photograph in uh, San Francisco last year this is an early version of Spotify. Uh, it's basically a jukebox from the United States from, I don't know where, like 19, 1930s, something like that. Anyway, you put a coin in and you press a button and you get a song. It's simplifying something. It means that the user doesn't have to carry around a big record player all the time. So it's simplifying something. And crucially, we also need to expect things, uh, the technology to evolve, particularly in this kind of software space that we're in, because the pace of change is increasing things will change even more quickly than they have done over the last 10 or 20 years. So we should expect this product to evolve. So what we're going to do next, so just remember, a platform is a curated experience for engineers. What we're going to do now is just take that word product and replace it with the word platform and see what comes out. So a platform is optional to use. No team is forced to use the platform. Platforms must instead advocate for their platform product and market it to internal users. It sets up a really important dynamic to make sure that what we're building in the platform is what teams actually need and want. And it forces us to think about it in terms of a product that actually we have to, we have to be able to describe why it's good to use. A platform is carefully designed and curated. 
platforms must be designed with the user with the user in mind. The user is internal teams with this strong focus on user experience or what's sometimes called developer experience, DevEx. I mean, I don't really like that term because it's not just developers, but anyway, it, it's, a, it's a useful concept, developer experience. Uh, so we're designing it with that user experience in mind. So that kind of means, hey, we're going to need some UX capability inside the platform as well. A platform simplifies something for users. So platforms must actually help users to achieve their goals by understanding their user needs and simplifying their tasks. So we actually need to use things like user personas and standard kind of UX type approaches and go and speak to, go and speak to software developers and understand what they need and then meet those needs. And a platform needs to evolve to take advantage of technology changes. This is, this is kind of really important when we're talking about kind of cloud native approaches because we need to expect not only to add new services to our platform, but to remove them as well. For example, we might initially build um, some kind of metrics integration because nothing exists in the market. As soon as a cloud provider makes that metrics integration available, then we're going to get rid of our own implementation. We're going to use the one from the cloud provider, probably, rather than building a, a second rate version. So we're really expecting to be, be quite brutal about getting rid of stuff that is just no longer relevant and, and consuming things from, from the, the cloud provider. And finally, a, a, pla a platform should use product management techniques and service management techniques. This also is something that's very unfamiliar to lots of kind of traditional infrastructure focused platforms of the past. And so it can seem a bit kind of scary. I've no, I know nothing about product management, let's say if I, if I come from an from a infrastructure background. The good thing is there are a bazillion organizations doing good products in the cloud right now and who blog about it and who talk about it and go to conferences and, and share, their, share their expertise about it. So we don't need to invent anything in this space. We just need to see what see the good patterns that are, are out there and adopt those and bring those into our own organization. So a platform needs modern product management and service management techniques as demonstrated by these kind of you know, hundreds of SaaS companies. So they're doing it for a public product. We take the same principles and we bring it into our organization and use it for our internal platform. It's the same set of principles applied internally. We need to have some product metrics for our platform. And a key starting point for, for product metrics is these four key metrics from Accelerate. Lead time, deployment frequency, mean time to restore, and change fail percentage. These four key metrics are, the, are, are predictive of high organizational performance. If we, if we improve these, we are likely to be improving a whole bunch of other things as well towards a kind of cloud native way of working. And crucially, we need to be improving these four key metrics in, the, in our customer teams, in the, in the stream aligned teams that use our platform. So the platform is a success if delivery in the stream aligned teams improves. And, and so a starting point is look at the four key metrics for, for, the, for the, these teams that use the platform. If the four key metrics improve when they use the platform, the platform is succeeding. If the four key metrics are getting worse, then have a conversation. Something about the platform is not working. We also need to make sure we've got some user satisfaction metrics in there. We actually need to go and ask our users, the people in these streamlined teams, about their experience with the platform. Do you like it? Is it, is it meeting your needs? There's a great example from the um, cloud API company Twilio, where they do a regular internal uh, survey in fact, they use NPS, Net Promoter Score, which is a classic kind of public marketing uh, type, type technique across multiple teams. Basically, would you recommend our platform to, to one of your colleagues? And so they've got, they've got kind of questionnaire that looks like this, like I can measure the operational metrics of my services or I can voice problems that result in improvements, this kind of thing. And get a kind of emotional response from, from our users, which is, which is fine. It's the right kind of, the right kind of information we're looking, looking for. We need to track how well we're, uh, teams are adopting the platform and how, how kind of engaged they are, how, how many of the services they're using, and use that as a signal to tell us whether we're doing, it, whether we're doing things well. Um, 
So we might have some teams that are using the platform, some that are not. What can we do to, to improve that? If are we, are we not meeting some needs? Do we need to market it better? Do we need to understand our customer needs better? And of course, some, some low level reliability metrics too. Um, but our starting point is, is the success of these streamlined teams. Not some technical aspects about uptime and whatnot that might have been used in the past. The success of the platform teams is the success of the streamlined teams, our customers who are using the platform. That's, that's our starting point for measuring the success. Let's look at uh, one example. Um, and this is from USwitch, which is UK-based uh, uh, consumer comparison site for, for switching uh, services like broadband and electricity, gas, this kind of thing, mobile phone. Uh, the full case study is online at our website, teamsapologies.com. If you, if you just search for USwitch on our website, you'll find it. The link is in the slides, which you'll get uh, after the session today. Um, now, going back a few years, they, they started off by having quite separate teams for different areas of the uh, different areas, different domains, effectively different business domains inside their organization. So one uh, team focused on, on mobile one team focused on energy, one team focused on broadband. These are very different business domains with very different kind of rules. And each team was basically fully independent. They uh, built their application, but they also built their cloud infrastructure underneath. And they were, they were they're fully independent. They owned that application end to end. And that was working well for them uh, for a time. But over time, the number of API calls heading out towards Amazon was increasing and increasing. This was, this was really meaning that each of these teams was having to do more and more work on the kind of cloud infrastructure, effectively. You can almost see it as the amount of cognitive load on each of these teams was also increasing as, as time went on, because they were dealing with more and more uh, of the lower level details. Uh, and this, was, this became a problem because the, effectively the, the, the rate of delivery for user facing features was slowing down because these teams were spending so much time dealing with the underlying aspects. And so the CTO, Paul Ingalls, decided to introduce a platform deliberately to, to force a change and make things more kind of cloud native. And Paul Ingalls says, we didn't change our organization because we wanted to use Kubernetes. We used Kubernetes because we wanted to change our organization. A deliberate decision to actually to kind of accelerate kind of a cloud native approach. And they're able to track the number of direct kind of API calls to, to, to Amazon. They started to go down as teams started to adopt this new platform. Um, and crucially, they had an explicit awareness they needed to reduce the cognitive load on these streamlined teams that were using the platform. Paul says, we wanted to scale our teams, but maintain the principles of what helped us to move fast, which is autonomy, work with minimal coordination and self-service infrastructure. Um, and they were treating the platform as a product. Um, they have made sure it was reliable, it's fit for purpose, but it's focused on developer experience. Um, back in 2018, they onboarded their first uh, customer internal team, but that was through the choice of that internal customer team. They were, that, that team was not forced. The, there's, there's no forcing that team to do it. Um, by 2019, they expanded what the platform offered and they could, they could offer some more features. And so additional teams decided to join, but there was still, it wasn't until the, end, uh, the middle of, uh, sorry, early 2020, by the, by, the time, by the time they got to this point, the team that was called highest money-making team decided to join the platform because they could see it had the features that were, that were useful for, for that team. And the crucial thing is that in basically sort of two years, without, without forcing any team to adopt the platform, all the teams are on the platform. And they were using the platform because it helped them deliver effectively. It sets up a really important dynamic not to force, uh, not to force teams to use a platform. So that was considered basically a success at that point. Um, so there's more details in, in, the, in, the, in the case study online. 
Uh, I'm going to skip one or two additional examples. You've already heard, uh, though, Jamie mentioned Adidas as a, as a great example. That, that's in the Cloud Native Transformation book. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the details today. Again, the, the, there's, there's links to uh, great conference talks online uh, for, from them, but you can see that they are, they're using some of the team's bodies concepts like these uh, different team types, different kind of interaction modes when they're thinking about what happens inside their platform. Interestingly, half of the time that their people spend is on what they call platform advisory and community, and half is on the evolution of platform itself. They have a, such a strong focus on working or on, on listening to their customers and understanding their needs. Half their time is spent on advisory and consultancy. Just think about that. Compare it to the situation in your organization. How much time is spent on, on building stuff versus versus actually reaching out and, and listening to what customers need. It's a, it's a really important balance. So what is platform as a product and why should I adopt this approach? A platform is optional to use. No team should be forced to use a platform. A platform is carefully designed and curated. A platform simplifies something for users. A platform evolves to take advantage of technology changes. We're not gonna hold on to this thing just because we built it two years ago. If there's a better thing from a cloud provider, throw, the, throw away the old thing, bring in the new, uh, that, that'll work better. And a platform uses modern product management and service management techniques. We have a product owner for different parts of the platform, multiple product owners. We use user experience techniques like user personas and this kind of thing. Ultimately, we end up with happier users, that's engineers in these streamlined teams, we're avoiding a bloated kind of technology platform, and we've designed it from the very beginning to evolve. Designed not just the technology, but the way in which we set up our kind of interactions and investment in uh, listening to our customers and this kind of thing. So a few ideas about getting started. Assess the cognitive load. How well can a team understand the current platform abstractions they need to use on a regular basis? It is early days with assessing uh, cognitive load on a team level, but we've got a GitHub uh, repository with kind of a template in there you can have a look at. We are doing some more work on, on this. But you can just ask, just send a survey saying, hey, how, on a scale of one to five, how, how well do you feel like you actually understand how this platform works? Go ahead and try and define what your platform actually is. What does it do? How well is it? How well can you actually describe it as a kind of like a product with features, a bit like kind of what Amazon or Azure or Google Google Cloud does? They describe specific different services. How well can you describe your own platform? Um, and what is the kind of user experience or developer experience of using this platform right now? Is that what it should be? There's probably a gap. And think about how you collaborate on new platform services. This kind of this this. Com this combination of collaboration versus providing something as a service and this kind of transition from one to the other on a regular basis over time. There's a whole bunch of extra examples of organizations doing this really, really well in the slides here. Um, we will be able to send those around, I think, after the webinar as well. Um, I've also linked to an article that talks a bit more about some of these aspects around cognitive load and kind of increasing flow. There's an article on Tech Beacon that we wrote recently. Uh, also linked here in the slide are some resources. If you go to teamtopologies.com slash resources, there's a whole bunch of links and slides and videos and whatnot uh, that, that, that will take you further with the, these ideas. And I mentioned that GitHub repository, uh, well, GitHub profile, github.com slash teamtopologies, where we've got lots of different repos for like templates and assessments and things like this. So uh, they're, all, they're all free. They're all kind of open source, if you like, uh, creative commons. So hopefully that's given you some useful things to think about and, and points for discussion uh, coming up now. So I'm looking forward to the, uh, looking forward to some chat and discussion now. Thank you very much, Matthew. I'll give you a little round of applause. I think everybody should unmute and clap. Um, <laughs> bravo, bravo. Thank oh, you, that oh, was you great. Do unmute yourself very good. and clap. Ooh. Hey, ooh. Okay, um, now before we get into the questions, we do have some questions, Matthew, and I've got a, we've sort of highlighted a few here. Um, I just wanted to come back to what you said about platform and advisory. So we, we work with big, big customers doing these transformations, and we literally spend hours on internal marketing, uh, mugs, uh, scripts, outreach, 
in training for executives and people cannot believe the amount of effort that goes in to teaching, not just cloud native, but how to onboard to their own platforms. Um, with that in mind, we have got a couple of questions and they're all skating around a similar theme. Are you sure it should be optional is the question. Why don't you make people use the platform? What's your answer to that? Because as soon as you make people use the platform, you have stopped listening to their needs and you will end up building something which is just not suitable. So that's why that's why the dynamic needs to be it needs to be optional. You need to force yourself to listen to what what your engineering teams actually need, and and have the right discipline to then say, okay, let's interpret what what they're saying. Let's understand how that fits into our pro kind of product roadmap, and let's build the right thing. Uh, if if you have compliance requirements, then bring the compliance requirements to the surface. Describe what the describe what compliant would look like and then provide a default implementation in the platform and say, hey, if you don't want to build your own, use this, or potentially expose a, a small toolkit that allows more advanced teams to still be compliant by using this toolkit, but you can still allow a team that, is, that has a specific different set of needs to build their own stuff in, in, in the right way by following the, the, the compliance guidance. But in the past, embedding the, the, embedding the rules about compliance into a platform without exp without making it clear what uh, what those rules are, and, and only having that option, you can only be compliant if you use this thing, and that's the only way to do it. You're cutting off a whole lot of uh, feedback loops. You're cutting off whole, you're cutting off a whole lot of signals. Cutting off a whole lot of kind of innovation and and improvement opportunities, and potentially slowing down a huge number of teams. I get the feeling people are concerned of rework. If the platform team is doing one thing and there's five other teams doing something similar. This is a real fear. I picked that up in the questions here, but we also picked that up from our customers. How do you address that one? So what does it matter if, 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 uh, if there's multiple teams doing the same thing? What we're, what, what we're optimizing for here is uh, speed of change, flow of change across multiple different independent decoupled work streams. Um, if they are if they have proper product management in place and a proper kind of PL, you know, fine uh, money associated to it. If the product owner for these multiple different streams says, yep, I'm happy to pay extra to go fast, that's fine. Of course, from an organizational perspective, you want to have some mechanisms in place or some sort of um, things in place in the organization to avoid accidental duplication. So you need things like lunchtime talks mm -hmm. or da daily talk, you know, weekly talks, something like this. You have some... Um, uh, um, some guilds or communities of practice, opportunities for people to share uh, share experience and knowledge and whatnot. Maybe some internal technology conferences where you get people together every six months and you and you kind of talk through, do little presentations, stuff like that, or webinars every week, whatever. Opportunity for people to say, "Hey, we're doing this thing. We we built this little compliance tool. Wow, that's amazing. Can we can we get access to that? Yeah, of course, no problem. Here's how you so you, you're not you're not trying to create duplication, but you're not you're not looking to have only one of every single thing. You're, you're allowing a bit, of, a bit of loose duplication, if you like, and loose coordination and kind of eventual consistency um, on, on how, how different things are approached. But, we, but we're not trying to optimize for a single, a, a single kind of implementation. It's so interesting that you bring that up because open space technologies, lunch sessions, brown bags, are such a massive part of our transformation work, even though we love Kubernetes. Now, I can see Dave it might have something to say here, but Dave, I'm going to stand you by for one moment because I want to bring Stuart in from Skyscanner and find out what they did. Because I seem to remember, Stuart, you doing a talk, and I'm sure you bullied somebody into using a platform. Absolutely. And I think I need to get Absolutely. to the facts of the matter. Yeah, no, I, I don't like the phrase bullied. Uh, I, I, I would maybe say, you know, con constructively pointing in the right direction. I, I, I do agree with, with Matthew about 92% of, of what he's saying in terms of, it, it feels like a far better product fit if people are wanting to adopt what you're doing. Um, but it's humans we're working with, right? And, and we have engineers who will simply not adopt something if they haven't created it, for example. Um, not invented here sort of syndrome, so they're, they're desperate to, to recreate it because they think they can do something better. You see that in the commoditization of the CI market. You can see um, all these startups starting because they think they can just slightly, uh, you know, go faster by 2% if they just did this thing. Um, 
So I, I think you you came round to it at the end there around um, holding people accountable. Um, now, yes, if they if they want to take a different path and they they want to um, iterate on what they've they, they're doing in, in terms of their approach, that's cool. But you, you do kind of want to hold them accountable for moving just as fast as if they were using the golden path and the, the tools and things you're providing and the investment that the business is making in something that is potentially you know company wide. So as long as that feedback loop is happening, as long as those conversations are happening, then then yes, I can I think that is a, a great approach. It's just there is just a, a temperance there a little bit, I think. And how do you deal with that, Stuart, in in, in in your experience? How do you deal with that tension? Do you live with it? Do you it I I, I think it, it's kind of a combination. I think the, the early adoption piece is a really interesting one. So if you look at the lean startup, you can sort of propose new things, start getting early adopters. If you get that uptake, then you know you've got something good. And then it's maybe a little bit of alignment on the last 50 to 80, you know, 20% of folks that are just like, no, I'd really rather use SQL Server 2008 and I don't really want to migrate to your AWS cloud nonsense. Like that does take a little bit of, of shifting. So I think dry, dry, that, iterating quickly, MVP, that sort of thing, and see what dr draws people in. And yeah, taking ideas from the business that haven't been started yet and, and maybe scaling those. Um, we, we've seen that in a, a few occasions where we've taken an idea from another squad and gone, right, we'll make this happen. Um, but I do think there is still that stick bit at the end to, to not have four, five, 12 different instances of something running. Right, we've got another question that's being teed up. Does anybody want to come back in on this question versus a platform? You must use it versus it's optional. Otherwise I think it'd be great to hear from Dave White. Because uh, I, I know they've done some really great stuff there. Okay, oh, I've just landed, Dave. I just landed you in it. Come on, Dave. If you're up for it. If you're up for it. Uh, let's cut noise up. Well, he's got to turn his music down. <laughs> Hello, mate. Yeah, I'm just saying that. Um, obviously, we've spoken quite a lot to Matthew. Believe in what he's doing. He contributed part of his book, so that's all good that side. Uh, We've gone with the slightly different approach that we've built a platform out. Basically, we set some, we've gone from completely on prem to very hard and fast, saying as a business, we want to move everything to uh, cloud, public cloud. And that was after uh, years of trying internal stuff. So we built our own uh, cloud stack setup. Uh, we have been our, our company for years and years. So, old school releases to given developers. Uh, permissions to release, giving developers visibility to lots of monitoring, shared monitoring, lots of fails, lots of successes, but we put a line in the sand and said we wanted to move everything to public cloud. And we built out platform utilizing uh, GKE, went with uh, Istio, and we pretty much got a lot of feedback at the start. At the start, we wanted to make sure that it had lots of visibility. So we're now at the tail end. So we're like 99% completed this migration, 400 apps in public cloud. And the best thing is that we're moving stuff across and we're getting loads of visibility. So utilizing Istio, moving an app, not just lift and shift, moving it, and then right, let's go to status code right, because now we've got visibility to see this and working with developers. And then we built in from ground up, utilizing the Slack. Uh, we've got the state now, always one platform, all developers are, are bought into it because they can see straight away in the data, as soon as they release, we know straight away where there's any increase in any errors, a developer can, gets the alert, so they own it, they acknowledge it, they can roll back to release as quickly as possible. Uh, or if they can't do it for whatever reason, Ops picks it up, but it's a complete shared thing, all working as one on one platform. But everyone is good. But the important points are though, is if anyone wants to improve part of the platform or change something, all they have to do is suggest it. They can even commit to stuff as an update, um, whatever they want to update and change. Um, but we've got now stuff like, uh, a one one app I can go to, I can put in the name of the and app space. Uh, it's a database of all our applications. I can go in there and put a name for our search platform, for example, or search app, and I can get straight away from that who's the owner, who's the sort of like operational squad body, what tier is it, a whole lot of of information that previously it would have been running around to try and chase people. Secondly, is in days I've been there so many times as an operation person trying to chase down someone to get ownership of some issue. It used to be a nightmare. Now, straight away, more times than not, a de developer, as soon as we get an alert through, will pick it up and say they're all over it. 
And if they need some support, like a wider support, we create an instant uh, channel on Slack and we invite people in and we all get together and those issues just get sorted, closed off and done. As operations person now, we don't have an instant queue. I don't have an instant, we ditched our instant system. All I do is live a Slack. I've got an issue, let's deal with it. Let's move on to the next issue. That's, that's how it operates. So that's we've very much got to one platform. It's, it's a great example of, of where patterns are contextual, like what Jamie was saying before. At, at, at Autotrader, where, uh, where Dave worked, the, the culture in the organization, the engineering culture, is really, really excellent. So they're, they're able to take that kind of approach. Other organizations, it's, it's not going to work so well, where, where you've got a, a less advanced, less, less, less collaborative, less, less friendly kind of uh, organizational culture. Other, other patterns need to be in place. That, that's what I've sorry, culture's, culture's key. We went through a massive culture change before and we actually lost a lot of people that didn't really buy into that culture. And if we hadn't done that at the start, a lot of what we did would have been really painful. So it's definitely, it's, it's got to be the right culture. Yeah. Def- yeah, of course, there's definitely a cultural element because, yeah, indeed. And of course, if you've got a good platform and a good culture, then your, your ops ticket's being reduced to a Slack conversation is awesome. Now, I'm conscious, everybody, we've only got four minutes left, uh, but we did promise a bit of Q&A. So, and I don't, want, I don't want to delay anybody's next meetings. Here's a quickie then, Matthew. Advisory and community building feels like they require completely different skill sets than building a platform service. Where do you find the right sort of people to build that advisory and community capability? Uh, yes, completely. I, I completely agree that, yeah, if you're, if you're looking at building community, if you're building advisory um, skills, um, I mean, the, the best person to ask is actually... Um, uh, uh, Fernando, who's on the call, I can see. I just realised uh, from Adidas. So actually, he might. If you if you want to reach out to him after the call, then then that's best person to ask. But those kind of skills sometimes you bring in from the outside. Uh, one of the one of the best kind of advisory community building people in technology that I know, trained as an actor, went to university and did English, and now is working uh, as as a database specialist. Yeah. But he's got that awareness. He's got the awareness of how to kind of present and, and, and talk to the people. You can train people. You can mentor. You can send people on training courses. Or you can bring people in from outside of technology who can then learn the technology enough to be able to do the advocacy. But you're right. You, can't, you cannot just assume that someone who's an ex- expert in databases or networking can immediately go out and do advocacy. There has to be some additional capability that so, we cite yeah. inside the platform. So everybody compliments Container Solutions on our amazing marketing. It grew out of our transformation. It grew because we could not succeed if we didn't learn to communicate. So the marketing team in CF did not, was not appended to the business because we needed to sell stuff. It grew from our work in Cloud Native. And people can barely believe that when I tell them, but it's the absolute truth. Any more questions? Now, Dave Fowler, you've been a bit quiet. I promised to bring you in on that last question. Do you have anything to come back to there or add to? Yeah, I, I think there's I think there's a few things just just part of the conversation in general that, that I'd be interested in. That. I I, th- I think the thing about um, uh, giving freedom for teams to to, to choose, I, I, I agree with Matt. I, th- I think it's really important to to to, to do that. I, and I've I've done that successfully in a variety of different scenarios. Um, the trade-off between whether you force people to take advantage of of some of these things or not. I think I think people under undervalue the cost of um, of coupling and dependency, organisational coupling and organisational dependency, and uh, allowing people more freedom to choose is how you allow them to move more quickly, uh, whether they use the platform or not. And, and I think that's an important thing. The other thing that I would like to say, which so so the first thing that I should say is that I agree with everything that Matt said but I disagree with the context in which he placed it because I don't think it's specific to cloud software. I think it's true of all software. And I don't think it's specific to platform. I think that you could you could replace the word platform in, in all of your examples with library or class, and it would say the same thing. This is really about the fundamentals of good design. And we don't speak enough about the importance of good design. And that's the, that's the failure point that I see in platforms because most platforms that I see aren't designed. They're a random collection of what's left over when you've took the other stuff out that, that you've decided you need to pull out. Right, Matthew, come back into that design question. Come back to Dave on that one. 
So absolutely, completely, absolutely. So I, I contextualized my my stuff around platforms today because we're talking about cloud native in, or we we framed it as cloud native in in this uh, what the fucking hour. But but a key aspect of that we wanted to bring in with with team topologies was applying good well good engineering principles, good software engineering principles to the organization and to how we think about the organization. And we talk about things like team APIs. We talk about uh, ways to find good boundaries. We talk about decoupled teams. This, these are all really good engineering principles that we're applying into organization because of this Conway's law mirroring and coupling between the organization and the technology. We have to look for good uh, patterns that enable rapid evolution of software and apply them to our organization too. So absolutely, I'm completely with Dave, absolutely. So it's, the, that's, that's, that's deliberate, absolutely deliberate that, that we're applying the, the, those patterns yeah. in that way. I mean, the thing is, we've lost the art of design. When I was a student, design mattered. And it's remarkable that a, a, a techn technology consultancy like us teaches executives design because that's what that's what platforms are. It's the design of action. If you say, oh, you need executive commitment, then you need that, then you need that. That's called strategy, which is also known as the design of action. And we have really, I blame the TDD as Dave, too much exploratory stuff. I blame, I blame the TDD as no, 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 Absolutely wrong. We haven't got, no, that, that was that was wrong because you don't give me time to give a comeback. No, exactly. So PDD, not, PDD is the tool that can give you this stuff. Right. And if you want to know more about that, you can go to Dave Farley's um, uh, YouTube channel, which we're also going to share. I think it's time to wrap this up because I know that everybody's got new, uh, other meetings. And if I don't wrap this up on time, then we're not going to be able to do it properly. So let me just stop this now by thanking everybody. Stuart for coming on and giving his experience of Skyscanner. Uh, Dave Farley is our guest in the Q&A. Uh, Carla from Container Solutions and Teresa, who makes sure that all of this happens and it happens on time. We had questions from two different Davids, Dave White and the other Dave at the very beginning. Lots of Daves in this webinar. Uh, thank you to Andy Randall. Thank you to Adrian Moa. Thank you to Bill from the CNCF. Did I miss anybody? And therefore, of course, thank you very much to Matthew Skelton, who was our number one guest today, who has brought this fantastic group of people together. Give us all the feedback that you want to, things we can improve, things that were awesome and you want to see more of. I love you all. Uh, this has been awesome. And I just think we need to unmute ourselves and give Matthew one more round of applause. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. The video will be made available. You can get a follow-up email, et cetera, et cetera. See you back on Twitter for more Kubernetes, Cloud Native, and uh, politics, potentially. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.